Thank you, everybody. My name is Pramila Malik of Protect Orange County. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm also a member of the Waywanda Six, a group arrested in 2015 while protesting Competitive Power Ventures Mammoth 650 megawatt frack gas power plant in the heart of Orange County. It is not only massive itself, but necessitates a vast network of infrastructure that creates an even greater impact footprint spanning from Pennsylvania to New York and including 100 to 150 fracking wells, according to an expert you will hear from today, as well as several compressor stations in the town of Minisink, Eldred and Hancock, and a new eight mile lateral pipeline in a dense and sensitive wetland area, the Valley Lateral Project, that would seize property by eminent domain as well as a signif significant expansion of Millennium Pipeline's main line known as the Eastern System Upgrade. When you approve a power plant of this magnitude, you necessitate all of that infrastructure. In 2014, Governor Cuomo banned fracking, citing risk to aquifers and human health. In 2015, CPV received their final permits from the New York State Public Service Commission and the town of Waiwanda. While concerns we raised in every permit process possible for this project about its public health and climate impacts, about its critical role in the fracking enterprise, were repeatedly ignored by key government officials Close aides to Governor Cuomo were making hundreds of thousands of dollars. Some elected officials received hefty campaign contributions from CPV. Senator John Bonasek's son got a job from them. Others covered their complicity by holding on to the deceptive bridge fuel narrative. Left with no other means of creating an official record of the project's impacts, we engaged in civil disobedience to effect a trial, which then finally allowed the scientific testimony to be heard, a process that should have rather occurred through <laughs> regulatory and legislative hearings. Today, you will hear from esteemed scientists from Cornell University, Anthony Ingrafia and Robert Howarth, about the clear and present danger this plant represents to New York and beyond. You will hear from actor James Cromwell, who was so compelled by their testimony that he is ready now to go to jail in defense of climate and our children's future. You will hear from Dennis Kucinich about the role of corruption in creating this cataclysmic crisis. From engineer Keith Shu about the failed energy policy that CPV's approval embodies. And from our lawyer, Valeria G uh, Georgiou, about the applicability of the necessity defense. And then finally, you will hear from George Ballard about communities near and far sacrificed from this project. Again, I thank you all for joining us, and I especially want to thank our scientists for taking their decades and decades of research and knowledge and work and really putting it to the public service. Thank you. Good morning, and uh, thank you, for Pramila, for that introduction, and thank you all for being here today. Uh, my name is Tony Ingrafia. I'm a professor emeritus of civil and environmental engineering at Cornell University. I have a brief statement I'd like to read. There are two main points in this statement. Point number one. Operation of the CPV Valley Energy Plant will substantially increase carbon dioxide emissions from New York State's electricity sector. Moreover, because it will be using shale gas for its operation, it will also cause an increase in methane emissions. And you'll hear more about that from my colleague Bob Howarth in a few moments. If the plant is operated at its design capacity, the plant will cause emission of at least, at least 4.7 million tons of, to these two potent greenhouse gases every year. To give you some idea of how much that large number is, it represents a 10% increase in greenhouse gas emissions from the entire electricity sector in the state of New York. I repeat that, this one plant in operation will increase CO2 and methane emissions 
from the electricity sector in the state of New York by at least 10%, most likely much more. And no, this plant is not replacing coal-fired electricity generation. The idea of this plant being part of a bridge to a renewable future is false. There is very little coal-fired generation left in the state of New York to replace. Rather, the CPV plant will be replacing renewable energy. It will stand in the way of renewable energy. Second point. CPV, the corporation, played politely, fast and loose with its emission numbers in its Part 201 air permit application. An application, by the way, which has not had its crucial data updated since 2008. On one page of that permit, CPV says they expect emissions from operating their plant on an average of 50% capacity every year, while on the very next page, they claim those same emissions would result from operating the plant at 100% capacity. At the very least, this is disingenuous. Personally, I think it's a frank lie. One does not operate a $900 million ultra-modern gas-fired power plant at half of its capacity on average over a year. And in 2017, one must include not only carbon dioxide emissions, but methane emissions. There is no mention of the word methane in either the air permit application or the FEIS for the CPV plant. In summary, that plant is built on a foundation of ignorance, deception, and corruption. Ignorance because they knew better than to not include methane. Deception because they lied to the DEC and the PSC in their air permit application. And I'm sure you're going to hear a lot more about the corruption aspect in a few minutes from other speakers. So Governor Cuomo, the message is very simple. You have a clean energy standard, CES, and you have CPV. They're in collision here. You can't have them both. It's in your power to uphold your own CES standard by eliminating CPV. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Bob Howarth, also a professor at Cornell University and an earth system scientist. I want to give a little bit more context on climate change in general, in which we find ourselves uh, arguing against this CPV plant, and then elaborate a little bit more on, on the methane idea that Tony has introduced. First, the planet is warming at the most rapid rate ever in the 4.2 billion history of our planet. That's beyond doubt. Climate has always changed, it's gone warmer and cooler, but we're now seeing the warmest temperatures in at least the last 100,000 years. And again, it's warming at the most rapid rate ever. Last year was the most uh, warm year in the, in the history of human civilization. The year before that was the next warmest before that. The last six years uh, are among the, the 10 warmest years ever in the history of human civilization, and the rate of warming is accelerating. Now, the nations of the world came together in Paris a year ago, year and a half ago, December 2015, and under the auspices of the United Nations, pledged to try and keep the planet well below 2 degrees Celsius, above the pre-industrial baseline, recognizing that was a dangerous temperature, and explicitly saying that we really want to try to keep the planet 1.5 degrees C below the pre-industrial baseline. Those are not arbitrary numbers. They're based on what the scientific community was telling the political world is what's essential. What's the basis of those? They seem like modest temperature increases. We've already warmed the planet by one degree Celsius above the pre-industrial baseline. The issue is that we're seeing damage already. We're seeing increased droughts, stronger droughts, increased storms, increased floods. That is a result of global warming already. As we hit 1.5 degrees, we increase markedly the risk of irreversible, catastrophic climate change that will take 10,000 years to reverse itself. That risk becomes quite high at 2 degrees C. Now, where are we? We will hit that 1.5 degree target in about 6 to 10 years from now, given our current rate of warming, and we'll hit 2 degrees in 20 to 25 years from now, given our current rate of warming. This is an imminent concern. And again, the, the risk is irreversible, catastrophic climate change, which will literally tear our society apart. 
what do we need to do to avert that? Well, the world needs to be completely free of fossil fuels by 2050, if we're to avert that. And because the United States has been the largest contributor of greenhouse gases historically, and because we're the best positioned nation in the world to do something about it, we need to be fossil fuel free in this country by 2035. 2035, not that far off. There's simply no more room for building fossil fuel structure such as this monstrous plant. The increase in CO2 and methane emissions that Professor Ingrafia mentioned are simply the wrong direction for this state and for this country given the urgency of climate change. Now a little bit about methane. Natural gas is mostly methane. Methane is an incredibly potent greenhouse gas. It's more than 100 times more potent than carbon dioxide when both gases are in the atmosphere. We are learning more and more about methane and methane emissions uh, just over the past several years. Uh, if you go back 10 years ago, the concern would have been with conventional natural gas, which certainly had a methane footprint. Now we're seeing more and more shale gas development. Professor Engrafia and I published the first ever paper on what methane emissions from shale gas might be like. We published that just six years ago. There's been a explosion of information on methane emissions since that time. And the best evidence now is that shale gas is a true climate disaster. If you include the methane emissions, I believe it has a greenhouse gas footprint that is two to three times larger than that of coal. That's a big deal. And it is bigger than that of conventional natural gas. So what we find is that although New York has banned fracking, we banned shale gas development in our own state, the Natural gas that we now use, which would have been conventional ga natural gas 10 years ago, is virtually all coming from Pennsylvania, from the Marcellus shale fields. It's all fracked shale gas. And that means it has a larger footprint. Our state is increasing its use of natural gas at a faster rate than any other state in the country, and this plant is a symptom of that problem. We need to get rid of not only fracking in our own state, but the use of fracked gas from wherever it comes from. Two other points I'd like to, to highlight here. One is that I think the best evidence is that somewhere in the neighborhood of 10% of the natural gas that's developed in the Marcellus shale is emitted to the atmosphere as methane. That's based on excellent satellite data. The global increase in methane that has been happening over the last 10 years is largely driven by shale gas emissions in the United States according to those satellite data. That's an important factor. Fracking is driving shale gas emissions, which are the largest source of methane increase on the planet over the last decade. And the evidence is that the acceleration of global warming that we've been seeing over the last decade is driven more by methane than by carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide emissions have actually been stable for the last three to four years. Methane emissions have been going up. So when I say last year was the warmest year ever, that's because of methane, and it's because of shale gas development in the United States. This is a very imminent problem. Finally, I want to point out that the issue of methane emissions remains contentious, and there are certainly scientists who would disagree with me, although I think more and more do agree with me. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency continues to lowball methane emissions. And I want to point out that last week, a week ago today, in fact, the Inspector General of the United States Environmental Protection Agency issued this alert, and there are copies back there for those of you who are interested. They are starting a formal investigation into whether EPA is lowballing methane emissions and the involvement specifically of a flawed University of Texas study in that, and specifically the engagement of the Environmental Defense Fund, which is up to their eyeballs in some of the, uh, the poor data that the EPA has been using. So let me, let me just end there again. Uh, we've banned fracking, and yet we're using fracked gas. New York is the largest growing state in the country in terms of using natural gas overall, and it is fracked gas. It has a high methane emissions. It has a very high greenhouse gas footprint, and we simply need to move in the opposite direction if we're serious about climate change. So I urge Governor Cuomo to very carefully consider this and to put an end to this gas uh, infrastructure build out including this plant. Thank you for coming today. Thank you all for being here and, and, and also thanks for, uh, for the invitation to, to join with you at this moment. 
just a little bit of background. It, it may have been two years ago that uh, Jamie Cromwell and Pramila Malik had called me to tell me what was going on in the lower Hudson Valley with respect to the plans to build a frac gas infrastructure. And uh, when they called, I started to conduct my own independent investigation with the help of uh, Pramila's research. And as I got into it, I decided that I, I had to come to New York to help the people. My own background is I'm, I'm someone, I was mayor of Cleveland. I uh, was also a member of the United States Congress for 16 years. I was chairman of an, a congressional investigative subcommittee. So I have a trained eye for being able to spot irregularities in process. Uh, because of that, I, uh, it, it, as soon as I heard about what was going on, I came out here to look and see for myself. I just want to give you some further background. As a result of my um, own independent investigation, I contacted both uh, the Environmental Protection Agency of the uh, U.S. government and the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission's inspector generals to ask them to, uh, to look at what was happening with the CPV project, uh, particularly with respect to the permitting process, and to essentially start it over, to order that it be started over. Um, the, uh, the issues that that I raised were in September, right after the indictments of some of the, uh, of, of at least one of the governor's top people and one of the people connected with uh, CPV, uh, in connection with a bribery scheme, which uh, corrupted the state permitting process uh, for that 650 megawatt plant. And, and I, I wrote to the inspector general uh, saying that since there is an abundance of evidence uh, produced that the New York State regulatory process has been corrupted in this uh, s uh, specific case, it's incumbent upon these inspectors general who have the oversight of these agencies to uh, uh, direct the agencies to rescind all air and water permits and to review all permits that have been issued by the state pursuant to federal law and to seek full engagement of the uh, affected public and otherwise retain jurisdiction over this uh, major energy project, which has profound environmental implications. It, it is uh, really extraordinary. The delegation of the permitting process that happened to where a, to a, a town could, in effect, make a decision for the whole state uh, and without appropriate review and with, uh, uh, with clear conflicts of interest where an attorney who represented a town ended up uh, working for the company advocating this uh, frac gas infrastructure. Totally inappropriate, total violation of ethics, conflict of interest, and it cried out for investigation and certainly never uh, should have been approved. Now, a as someone who is, is familiar with governmental corruption and has fought such corruption all my life, I can say that the... Uh, the Tammany Hall of Boss Tweed may, ha may be long gone, uh, but the political and spiritual rot it typified is alive in Albany, and it's exemplified by the colossal arrogance of impassiveness and indifference of a two-party duopoly which is ransacking some of the most pristine land in the United States, threatening the air and the water and the land of some of the most beautiful communities in the Hudson Valley in the name of an unnecessary, outmoded, dangerous energy, which is really anti-technology and, uh, and, and will produce economic benefits uh, solely for multinational interests. Now, I am here today at the invitation of people of the Lower Hudson Valley communities to lend my support uh, and my voice uh, to, uh, uh, to defend those uh, six citizens of the way, way on to six, who, these brave citizens who have uh, challenged the, this corporate political behemoth 
uh, and who have put themselves on the line in an attempt to stop construction of this frack gas infrastructure. They stand not for themselves, but for community. Their cause is not simply the fierce urgency of, of the present, but it is about taking a stand for, the f for future generations. It's about uh, the preservation of community, the protection of air and water and land, which is the inheritance of all people of New York. Uh, these brave citizens uh, dwell at the threshold of a future which is threatened by increased levels of atmospheric carbon, uh, a, a, a New York coastline which will pay an increasingly heavy price for political payoffs as sea levels rise and threaten business districts and residential communities. Finally, as someone who is currently involved with the media, I ask a simple question of my brothers and sisters in the New York media. If top associates of the governor are under indictment for improper conduct in the granting of permits for CPV, why in the world have those permits not been revoked or at least the process itself started once again, honestly? This whole project is riddled with conflicts of interest and improprieties. As someone who has spent a half a century in, uh, in and around government at local, state, and federal levels, I can tell you uh, that the moment that this project was explained to me, it had corruption written all over it. I chaired a congressional investigative subcommittee on domestic policy, which was instrumental in investigating and unearthing the scandals involving the Bank of America and, and Lehman Brothers. It's easy for anyone with experience to see something is drastically wrong, dramatically wrong with the permitting process, which resulted in the CPV project, uh, the mini sink compressor and the associated pipelines. Where are the New York officials? Why aren't they standing up for their people? Why is the political process in the state immobilized in favor of these corporate interests? Today, these citizens, uh, and there are citizens here who intend to stand in contempt of court, who are ready to go to jail, to stand up for the rights of all the people. Well, I believe it is Albany and this government at the state, which is con in contempt of these citizens, in contempt of the environment, in contempt of the air and the water, and in contempt of New York's natural resources. Thank you very much to all of you for standing here. And I stand with you. Thank you. And I'd like to make an, take the liberty of making an introduction for the next uh, speaker, who has uh, been someone I've worked with over the past decade and more, someone who has shown a, a fearless determination to stand up for people, someone who has uh, not uh, rested on, on his celebrity, but has instead turned it into a, a moral cause for the elevation of the cause of the environment and the protection of the lives of people of the Hudson Valley in New York State. I am just honored to be here today with all of you and with my friend Jamie Cromwell. Jamie, thank you. We are at a tipping point. Either we end our reliance on fossil fuels or face a catastrophe of epic proportions, which may lead to the extinction of all sentient life on this planet. Those in power who belittle or deny this scenario are criminally irresponsible in maintaining policies that make this outcome inevitable. The corporate media as well is complicit in this farrago of obfuscation and has failed its obligation to inform the public and to tell the truth. The six people who committed an act of civil disobedience against the construction of CPV, the power plant in Weiwayanda, New York, were convicted of a minor infraction of blocking traffic, while the real crime, the potential emission of millions of tons of CO2 annually, goes on unopposed and unacknowledged. 
I believe this is an injustice which must be resisted no matter what the cost to one's personal freedom. I will not comply with the court's imposition of a fine and 16 hours of community service and choose jail over stupidity. It is time to resist. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Keith Shu. Uh, I'm an engineer, an electrical engineer, uh, technical advisor for Otsego 2000, and it's a pleasure to be here with all the other fine people who have joined us uh, today. And let me start by saying that what you're, what, what's happening now is, a, is not happening in isolation. This project uh, and many other projects that have preceded it, and unfortunately some projects that might follow it, uh, relate to uh, a, a misguided path. It relate, relates to going in the direction backwards, moving us toward more fossil fuels instead of less. Uh, over the last 10 years, um, within a 10-year time frame, 2004 to 2014, uh, New York has dramatically expanded its use of natural gas. Um, we're now number four uh, in the whole country for the use of natural gas. And, and as for, for electrical power, um, we're, we're, we're growing extremely rapidly. This is what you're seeing right now. Uh, actually, this is August of last year. It, the, the picture has become even more dramatic. Uh, natural gas is expanding rapidly uh, for electrical generation in, in the state of New York. Uh, that, that picture of coal, uh, the, the bar there for coal, that's almost gone right now. That, that, that's almost gone right now. Uh, so uh, what we're seeing is, is a, a very lopsided energy portfolio here. Renewables, yes, there's some growth in renewables. It's not enough. So uh, we talked about CPV, uh, the, uh, the, the, um, the CPV uh, power plant, 650 megawatt uh, that's, that's under construction right now. Uh, you remember how, like, if you, if you go to a movie and uh, it's a really, a really bad movie, um, you don't know why you went to it, then a sequel comes out and you say, well, I, I got to check that out anyway. You don't know why you do it, but you do it. And sure enough, it's worse because uh, sequels usually are worse. Um, sure enough, we have another power plant that's, uh, that, that is uh, coming down the pike. 1,100 megawatts, Cricket Valley Energy Center, just uh, up the road uh, in Dover, uh, uh, just east of Poughkeepsie. Uh, 1,100 megawatts, $1.6 billion. They want to be in service by 2020, January of 2020. So when you add these two things together, CPB and Cricket Valley, 1,750 megawatts of power. That's 6 million metric tons of CO2, and that's just CO2, okay? Uh, others talked about methane. That adds to this number. So 6 million metric tons of CO2 annually that would be produced. Uh, that would be an increase of carbon dioxide from electricity generation by 20%. And again, like, like has been said, methane amplifies that even more. And I just want to point out that uh, it's the big power plants, but it's also the small ones. You've heard about REV, reforming the energy vision. It's the, it's the path that, uh, that the governor and the state want to be going. It promotes distributed generation. That sounds good. Wind, wind uh, turbines, uh, solar panels in our backyards, that's nice. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the uh, distributed generation that's coming about as part of the REV program uh, is gas-fired. Uh, we're talking about smaller 20 megawatt, 25 megawatt, or smaller facilities uh, that would be burning fracked gas. This is not uh, a move in the right direction. This is a move backwards. Distributed generation from renewables is great. Distributed generation from fossil fuels, not so good. And we're seeing that the pattern is continuing. Unfortunately, today, this is from uh, the 2017 Power Trends New York ISO document just, to, just hot off the press a couple weeks ago. 56% of all proposed electricity capacity, new capacity in the state of New York, is fracked gas. Now, okay, wind looks like it's, you know, impressive here, and it is more than it ever has been before, that is true. But when you look at these numbers, gas is still winning out. We're not going to meet our climate goals. We're not going to reach, reach our renewable goals if we are building more of that and let, than, than, than wind. And I want to point out also that this is relating to capacity, okay? Capacity, that's megawatts. Uh, the actual amount of energy we get from, uh, from power plants is measured in megawatt hours. 
uh, wind, you've heard it said, the wind doesn't always blow, and that's true. What this means is that there's actually far more investments going than even what this diagram shows in fossil fuels. You can imagine this bar, the green bar, being about half of its size, 40 percent of its size, solar being, being about 15 percent of its size. So, so this is a, a problem. We are moving in the wrong direction. Let's talk about wind for a second. For a second. Uh, you might say, well, that looks like wind is maybe going to catch up. We're, 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 making, we're making some progress. Um, and, and slow and steady uh, wins the race. That's not true. Slow and steady loses the race. Fast and steady is what we need right now. The climate crisis demands that we act quickly and, and responsibly. This is what's happening in, in, in uh, wind right now. It's pretty much flattening off. You know, I could also show you a picture, which I won't, but there's a, there's, there's a, I could show you a picture of how much energy we're getting from this, and actually it's dropped down in the last few years. So this is not something to be proud of. We need to do, do more of that. Okay, if we have accelerations of, of wind like that, we'd be in good shape. It hasn't happened. Okay, um, well, what about offshore wind? You've heard a lot about offshore wind. That would be wonderful, and it is if it happens. Uh, 700 megawatts has been authorized. Uh, the governor has talked uh, loosely about maybe 2,400 megawatts of, of, of wind. That would be wonderful. Um, but let's do some numbers. Let's do some number crunching. When you look at the capacity factor of wind, which it, it, it does cannot operate around the clock because the wind's not always blowing, um, that ends up being about equivalent to a 960 megawatt base load generator that can operate continuously. Okay, so sorry, folks, 2,400 megawatts offshore is wonderful. We need to do it. We need to do it quickly. But it still doesn't make up for the bad news, which is CPV and Cricket Valley. So this is, this is our energy portfolio today, uh, renewables, nuclear, fossil fuels. Uh, with the CES that, 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 that Tony mentioned, um, we want to get to 50 percent renewables. Okay, look very carefully at this picture and what it, what it implies here. The fossil fuel component of this went down by about 43 to 32 percent, 11 percent from what it was. That's an impact, but it's not enough. We need to do far better than that. And I also got to ask you the question this, what happens after 2030? Okay, these nuclear power plants are eventually going to shut down. When that happens is if this becomes all orange, if this becomes all fossil fuels, then guess what? Compare that to that. Our emissions just went up. They didn't go down at all. So what we need to do is rapidly expand our emphasis on the production of renewable energy. And we need to start right now. We need to do much uh, more aggressively than we have in the past. One last point I want to make is um, everything we've talked about here is electricity generation. But the, the, the goals of the state are for climate change as a whole. How do we bring uh, greenhouse gas reductions, how do we bring uh, greenhouse uh, gas emissions down 80 percent or better? Well, it means we can't just look at electricity. We have to look at the other things, the cars we drive, um, the, how we, how we uh, heat our homes, the furnaces in our homes. Well, we need to be getting into electric vehicles. We need to be uh, uh, converting to uh, electric heat pumps. And, and, and hear what I just said there, electric, electric uh, vehicles, electric heat pumps. That means we need more electricity, okay? That means that this piece, this sector of our, carb, of our, of our total energy footprint has got to get bigger. That hasn't been accounted for either. So we need renewables to meet our existing goals. We need renewables to, to meet our future goals as well. Um, thank you very much. I'm uh, George Ballard with SCRAM, which is Sullivan County Residents Against Millennium. Um, we've heard from our other speakers today about the threat to our climate in the long run. And it, in the immediate terms, uh, this build out of infrastructure, whether it's CPV or Millennium Systems upgrade, Eastern System upgrade, represents an immediate threat to people on the ground in the communities where these this infrastructure is placed. In the town of Hancock, there currently is a compressor. 60 miles away, there's a compressor in Minisink. Both of these compressors have caused numerous health problems for the surrounding residents, whether it's respiratory issues, rashes, headaches, sleep disruption. We know that these plants, by Millennium's own filings, put out a wide range of toxins. 
Hancock, they now propose a second compressor. This, this second compressor will require a Title V permit, 100 plus tons of hazardous air pollutants a year for the residents in that area. 25 miles away, the proposed Highland compressor. Uh, this is a 22,400 horsepower compressor in the middle of pristine forest, high canopy forest that New York State designates an important bird area. Um, it's also an important people area. Uh, Governor Cuomo makes it a point to come up and visit our area and paddle down the river, and, which makes for a great photo op. But he should know that when he comes up there, we are more than a photo op. We are people. We do not want this as our future. And you are saddling us with this, not just now, but for the next 20 years, 30 years, with no plan for decommissioning this. Um, Minisync is the final compressor in this chain. And uh, this represents now proposed four compressors in 60 miles. This is double the industry standards. There are plans afoot. They do not say what it is. They cannot say because segmentation is illegal. But if these four compressors go in, you can be sure that this will power Cricket Valley and other plants that will further saddle us to this toxic infrastructure. So I, I'm begging our political leaders who have, at this point, abandoned us to start paying attention to your citizens about the health, of, the health and safety of your citizens, which is your number one priority. Um, one last thing. Sullivan County is 61st out of 62 counties for health. And so I'd like to ask our legislators and Governor Cuomo, how does this help us? Thank you. Hello, my name is Valeria Georgia, and I'm one of the attorneys for the Way Way On to Six. Michael Sussman at trial mentioned, compared the Way Way On to Six in, their, in committing their acts of civil disobedience to those who organized the sit ins at the lunch counters and on the buses. Part of a long legacy in this history in the history of our nation to promote democracy. This, these courageous acts of the way we on to six should have inspired the trial judge, but instead he cowered. He cowered behind a petty legal loophole. The basic elements of the climate necessity defense for those of you activists that I hope will continue in per to persevere in, in these acts of civil disobedience are as follows. First, that when faced with the choice of two evils, you choose the lesser of the evils to prevent an imminent harm. And now we all know from our experts here that climate change is imminent. There are climate refugees already. Islands are sinking. The species and our future as a species are in peril. Another element of the climate necessity defense is that those committing civil disobedience understand that their acts are reasonably, reasonably believe that their acts will prevent or that greater harm. And in delaying this, the construction of the CPV, P, CPV facility, I believe they, they met that element. The final element is that this, those who committed civil disobedience have exhausted, have reasonably exhausted their legal remedies. Now it's not a final exhaustion, it's reasonable exhaustion in that they reasonably believe that their efforts at organizing, at petitioning, at attending public hearings, at submitting public comments, even litigation were not successful in the face of corrupt politicians. And so left with no choice after the final litigation failed, the last litigation failed, left with no choice and realizing their legal remedies had been e exhausted and, and, and not, no further legal remedies would work. They committed acts of civil disobedience with courage and generosity for all of us. And it is my hope that the future justices who will hear our argument as we appeal on behalf of the Way We On to Six 
will be inspired to make history and grant the climate necessity defense to the way beyond to six for the first time in this nation and around the world. We're at a critical juncture, juncture and it is time. And I want to thank the Way Beyond the Six for their courageous acts and all those climate justice activists doing the same around the country, as well as the climate justice attorneys who shared their briefs with me generously through the National Lawyers Guild so that we could prepare a very well-crafted defense. And I want to thank Michael Sussman as well for his work in all of this. So good luck and thank you very much. I want to address, before we open it up to questions, um, the elephant in the room. The indictment made clear that Competitive Power Ventures was working very hard behind the scenes with state officials to ensure the premature closure of Indian Point. Um, the expeditious closure of Indian Point to open up the market for their own new, brand new frack gas power plant. And to Governor Cuomo, I would say you can't trade poisons and trade victims and call it an environmental victory. It is not. Uh, we're, we're tired of being forced to choose between door number one and door number two. Um, one door is catastrophic and the other door is cataclysmic. Um, we're, we, we, we're tired of that deception. Um, renewable energies are, are available, accessible. We need to muster up the political will to implement them. We need a Marshall Plan to uh, develop uh, renewable energy immediately. So um, does anybody have any questions? So the question is, how is the fracked gas coming in to New York State? There are numerous pipelines that bring fracked gas from Pennsylvania into New York State, but the biggest one right now is the Millennium Pipeline. It's a 182-mile pipeline that travels along the southern border of uh, New York State. It uh, has gathering lines from all of the shale fields in Pennsylvania that feed into it. Um, it is co connected to the proposed Crestwood storage facility. Um, it is connected to the Minisync compressor station, those compressor stations that have um, been making uh, residents sick. Um, it goes through the heart of our Black Dirt region. Uh, Black Dirt region was declared by our state senator, by the way, whose son is attorney for CPV. Uh, but the Black Dirt was declared as the official state of soil of the state of New York because it's so rare and rich and precious. And um, the pipeline goes right through that. Uh, this plant will sit on the edge of that black dirt region. And I want to point out something about this plant, that this was a pristine greenfield area. This was a critical environmental area. It was completely absurd to allow a local town planning board to approve a project of this magnitude. And none of the other related infrastructure, the pipeline, the lateral pipeline, the compressor stations, um, were ever included in the environmental review of this project, and we believe very strongly that all of that was a result of corruption. So uh, the question is to describe the bigger picture in terms of the frack gas infrastructure and fossil fuel infrastructure build out in New York State. And before I invite any one of our experts uh, to comment on it, I would just say that we need to understand that power plants are the drivers of all of the rest of the infrastructure, that when you approve a massive power plant of this magnitude, you're going to need pipelines, you're going to need compressor stations. And um, that is the reality, especially with fracked gas, that it requires that tremendous infrastructure build out. And so it's really a result of a failed energy policy. And people refer to pipelines as the black snake. We say that those power plants are the heads, heads of the black snakes. Uh, part of the reason I, I showed the presentation I did was to, to, to try to explain how this is part of a bigger problem, a much bigger problem, as you said correctly. Um, Cricket Valley is coming right down the, the road after this one, but it's also been preceded by, uh, by a whole series of bad decisions. Those bad decisions relate to approvals of other power plants that have occurred. We are dr we've dramatically increased our dependency on fracked gas for electricity generation but not just for electricity generation, for everything else too. We are now the fourth largest consumer of frack gas, of natural gas, in the country. Um, that's nothing to be proud of. Um, we, we absolutely need to be moving much more quickly to renewables. Um, that's, that's, that is the only option we have here, um, given, the, given the, the situation today. Um, 
uh, the consequences of not doing that, as as you know, is is dramatic. Uh, impacts upon our climate, and that's going to last us for future generations. Uh, if you look at other fights that have been fought in New York, uh, the, the folks that have, have uh, valiantly uh, fought the Spectra pipeline expansions, uh, the, the, the folks who fought the Dominion uh, expansion project, um, uh, we've had some successes, but the successes we've had, like Constitution Pipeline or the Northeast uh, Pipeline project, those were brand new facilities in, in called greenfields in areas where pipelines didn't exist before. So we've had some success there. But we need to have success also in the projects that involve expansion of existing fu uh, gas infrastructure. Because if we don't do that, we're just playing whack-a-mole. We're, we're, we're succeeding here and then failing somewhere else, and we're not making the difference that we need to make. I want to add to the, the, the big picture you're asking. There are 19.8 million people, citizens of the New York State. And you're saying, well, somebody living up on St. Lawrence shouldn't care about what's happening down here, right? No, let me finish. How are they going to heat their homes? How are they going to heat their hot water? How are they going to cook the hot dogs in the kitchen? Uh, what kind of electricity they're going to be using when they're turning on the lights? It's, we're all related. We're all on the same grid. And what the, what the gas companies want to do and what some politicians are enabling is the gasification of New York State. Not the electrification, the gasification. You will hear, let's have more natural gas-fired vehicles, clean air vehicles, right? Natural gas, compressed natural gas, and buses in New York City is great. No, it's not. So whether you're driving a vehicle, you're heating your house, you're heating your hot water, you're cooking in your kitchen, or you're buying electricity from your local utility provider, you are an enabler. Or you're not an enabler. And that involves all 19.8 million people. One other aspect looking at the, at the big picture, if we go back 10 years ago, there really was no such thing as shale gas. You know, shale gas is a modern invention. The technologies which allow us to get at the high precision directional drilling and the high volume hydraulic fracturing which allow the development of shale gas have really only come into commercial play in the last 10 years. And half of all of the shale gas that's ever been developed on the planet has been developed in the last four years, right? A large part of that is coming from Pennsylvania, from the Marcellus Shale. And simply due to our proximity, we are receiving that gas. If we go back again 10 years ago, 99% of the natural gas in the United States was from conventional sources. Now it's about 65% from shale gas. And again, because of our proximity, all of ours is from shale gas. And the environmental footprint of developing shale gas is far larger than from conventional natural gas. In terms of methane emissions, it's about three times larger, but it also has other larger footprints. So at the same time that we've gone about this gasification of the state that Professor Ingraffi has talked about coincides with the development of, of shale gas, which is a true, true disaster. During the winter, my wife and I were in North Dakota uh, in support of the Standing Rock tribe who were experiencing uh, the same kind of challenge to their lives as people are experiencing throughout the Northeast now. Um, and it was discovered, and recently a court decision made it very clear, that the whole story about the effects of uh, putting a pipeline underneath a waterway w was not uh, revealed, and in fact, uh, a spill modeling um, study, which would have showed the risk to the water, uh, was shelved and not disclosed to the public. Now, a court decision has forced a review of this. I mention it because uh, this is a national problem that threatens our environment. It, th it threatens the environment of people in North Dakota, in Oklahoma, in Ohio, in Pennsylvania. And if you go to what Bob was talking about in terms of the drilling, w when they talk about fracking, what, what does it really mean? Fracking means they're fracturing the rock. <laughs> they're fracturing the earth. They're, and in doing so, with this particular type of drilling, they're ruining water supplies. They're creating a potential for earthquakes. And, the in, and well, Governor Cuomo has famously said, no fracking in New York State. 
by bringing in frack gas through this state and setting up an infrastructure, he's actually blessing all the fracking that's taking place to the west of New York. If you're not for fracking, you don't use the product. Hello? So... So the infrastructure that they're talking about, every place along the, the route pays a price. The pipeline, the Millennium Pipeline that comes into the state, the compressors that are built in order to facilitate the movement of the gas uh, forward, the additional pipelines that are built to serve other uh, uh, power plant constructions, the emissions that come from the power plants, the escape of gas that comes from the various compressor stations, this is a triple canopied environmental nightmare. And, and it really calls for a, a, a reveille, an awakening of people all over the country, not just in New York State. But here we come down to six people and their attorneys who not only get the big picture, but they're putting themselves on the line. So I'm glad that you asked that question because the implications of this are, are, are not just simply for Weyweyando, Work, and all these other communities along the way and throughout Orange County. These implications are for the whole country and for the whole country's energy policy. So this, uh, you know, as often happens in the struggle for civil, social, economic rights, the efforts of a, of a small group of people have the potential to, to change the world. So thank you again to all of you for taking that stand. Uh, I'm certainly not an expert, so this is just my opinion. If you look at the uh, Canadian tar sands, wh where are they sending the tar sands oil? They're trying to send it through the XL pipeline down to Texas so they can refine it and sell it to the rest of the world. Now, the fracking industry, the, the oil, uh, the gas industry, is very capital intensive, so they have created an immense amount of debt in order to build this infrastructure, and they have to service that debt. And so when you think of, say, two power plants in the state, or you think of maybe four, and you think of all the infrastructure, to my mind, the real reason for this is to ship the gas that they get from those shale fields up to Canada to liquefy it, to sell it to countries in Asia and in Europe, and that's the reason, and the reason people should be concerned is, we all live on this planet. We can't escape the consequences of acts like these on the environment, on our well-being. And we have a responsibility for this entirety of this planet. That is what's being threatened. That's why, why we must mobilize. That's why it affects everybody. And they will lose, and we will win. Thank you. Thank you for that question. So the question was, um, where is um, uh, an assessment of from by the Homeland Security Department of Homeland Security on um, the security um, of this power plant as a potential terrorist target? And ag again, once again, uh, it speaks in to me. It speaks to the corruption because you have the state, which allowed the power plant to get away with not using the Article 10 citing process, which would have mandated such a review, and allowing, abdicating the assessment and the review to a small town planning board dealing with this billion dollar company um, that has, you know, that is willing to engage in any means they, they need to in order to get their approvals. So, um, you know, the town was easy pickings for, uh, for this company. But no, there was no Homeland Security assessment. And it is a huge security risk uh, for all of Orange County. And if anyone, I encourage all the reporters out there to actually take a look. First of all, it's massive. Um, it's uh, beyond belief when you look at it. But also, it's, it sits right in, in the middle of three major transportation arteries. If there is a catastrophic event at that location, all those three arteries are immediately shut down. I-84, uh, 17, and, and uh, Route 6, which is a major uh, interstate route. So it was very, very poorly sited. There was no security assessment. 
And um, as many things, the climate impact wasn't assessed. The, you know, there was no, uh, you know, assessment of the security. Nothing was properly reviewed. And so we, you know, and our, this is really the responsibility of our governor. Um, power plants are projects of statewide significance. They're supposed to be approved, reviewed um, by the state of New York, by the executive, and it should be consistent with our energy plan. And as you can see, it's not consistent with our energy plan. And the question is, um, even though there is a federal investigation, can the legislature uh, hold its own independent hearings on what transpired here? Absolutely. There is, I mean, the state has the ability, and the legislature has an absolute ability to be able to inquire as to the conduct of any office, of any citizen of the state relating to any state policy. Now, those who are called to testify also have the right not to testify against themselves if it would incriminate them. But the state does have that right, and it's more than curious that uh, no hearings have been held uh, given the information that was produced out of uh, Preet Bharara's office uh, in the investigation of people in the governor's office. Uh, but again, that points to a problem that New York and other states have about a... Um, uh, um, an inappropriate closeness between government and corporate interests. So the question was about the necessity defense and if there are other similar cases around the country. And I'm going to let Valeria answer that, but I just want to speak a briefly about our specific case. In our case, and the court, by the way, the judge's ruling is there in the materials that you can take with you. The judge accepted and acknowledged that there was going to be enormous harm as a result of this power plan. However, the only thing he disagreed on was imminence. And he said that because we engaged in this action two years before the plant was scheduled to become operational, in other words, that the emissions would actually start flowing, um, we did not meet the definition of imminence. The harm was not imminent. Um, I, I disagree with that. I think the testimony of our experts was clear that the harm was, in fact, imminent. And it also ignored the public health testimony. We had, uh, we had a physician testifying on public health impacts that were underway as we spoke in many think My own daughter is one of them. We have had families in our community already experiencing health impacts, respiratory problems, nosebleeds, headaches, rashes, um, neurological problems. This was documented by a team of scientists. So those harms were ongoing and you know they were present. So uh, I think that more than met the uh, criteria for imminence. And it was clear that the mini sink compressor station was a related facility and was part of this project. And uh, one of the pieces of evidence we have is power plants need compressor stations. In the original design of this power plant, um, the compressor station was supposed to be right on site. And for, I believe, for various engineering and technical reasons, they decided that they had to move it some distance from the power plant. And that's when the mini sink compressor station proposal was put forth. And, um, and be once it, and once it became uh, approved, they removed the pr compressor station from their own site plan. So we know the mini sink compressor station was built for this power plant. Um, Valeria, you want to speak about that? Sure. <clears throat> okay, so there was uh, recently a case coinciding with the Way Wayanda Six uh, in Mount Vernon, Washington. Uh, one defendant in Washington State who also used the climate necessity defense, but they likewise uh, haven't uh, found Ken Ward. Um, they didn't grant the climate necessity defense to him. And, and it's interesting because Ken Ward was a longtime environmental leader, and he actually worked in the field and in policy for decades, and then he turned to civil disobedience. Um, he entered a Kinder Morgan pipeline facility in Anacortes and turned a valve, Washington, and turned a valve to cut off the flow of tar sands oil entering from Canada. So he, and, and, and there were other act, activists that he coordinated with um, shut it down in Montana, North Dakota, and Minnesota who were responding to a call for action from the Standing Rock encampment and together succeeded in temporarily halting the flow of all tar sands oil into the U.S. 
So sorry, I'm reading here. But, um, but unfortunately, it hasn't been granted yet in the U.S. Um, or, or around the world. The, the, there was one other case, I believe it was People v. Gray, um, a, a couple years ago in New York City where climate, in a sense, where, where the climate necessity defense was argued. It wasn't granted. However, the judge likewise did take judicial note and, in other words, accepted the fact that climate change is happening. Uh, and again, it didn't win on imminence. Now, I want to point to some of the language um, where this court not only failed on imminence, but it also failed on um, the legal, um, sorry, the legal um, remedies uh, that still. So essentially, in, as I explained before, the you know we we all understand imminence. Climate change is imminent. We all agree to that. The judges are bonkers. So, <laughs> um, however, with, with respect to the legal remedies available, it's not so much that, um, it's not so much that, that you have to exhaust all legal remedies. It's more that, in New York at least, that you have to, you have to consider the efficacy of legal remedies and that the uh, activists reasonably availed themselves of legal remedies that were, were working and that one, at, at the point where it's not working anymore and you see that, then, then you commit civil disobedience to stop the harm. So uh, it's, that, it's that no, there are no reasonable legal alternatives to the defendant's conduct. Um, that no reasonable legal option exists for averting the harm. Once again, the proper inquiry here is whether the defendant reasonably believed that there was no legal alternative to his actions. The defense does not legalize law lawlessness. Rather, it permits the courts to distinguish between necessary and unnecessary illegal acts in order to provide an essential safety valve to law enforcement in a democratic society. It has been asserted that because a democracy creates legal avenues of protest, alternatives must always exist. In the opinion of this court, however, to dispense with the necessity defense by assuming that people always have access to effective le legal means of protest, protest circumvents the prop purpose of the defense. And that was from People v. Gray in 1991, representing a bunch of bicycle activists uh, protesting pollution in New York City, I believe. So, so I mean, the point here is uh, we have a corrupt political process. Legal remedies have mostly failed. The current legal action is stalled, and construction is ongoing. So, in terms of the necessity defense, it's critical because it shows that the judges understand that the actions of the activists are necessary at this stage. Uh, and when courts start recognizing that, even though the, the mainstream society is already on board, or we hope they are, um, then you, you start seeing changes. Mm -hmm.